And now I'm going to introduce our next segment. So we have a very exciting keynote speaker up next, Ambassador John Erbs. Ambassador Erbs is a senior director of the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center and served for 31 years as a foreign service officer in the US Department of State, retiring at the rank of career minister. He was the US ambassador to Ukraine from 2003 to 2006, where he worked to en enhance US-Ukrainian relations, helped ensure the conduct of a fair Ukrainian presidential election, and prevented violence during the, the Orange Revolution. Ambassador Erbs has written on sta stability operations in Ukraine, and he has an is an accomplished speaker on the Ukraine crisis. We will have a few minutes for questions after the ambassador's talk as well. So feel free to submit your questions in the comments section on the post on the top right of your screen. Welcome Ambassador Ertz. Hi, okay. I'm glad we've reconnected. Uh, all right, so let's talk about what's going on in Ukraine how this relates to American interests and what Washington and NATO and the EU and other partners are doing about it. Uh, essentially, Putin has been pursuing a what experts call a revisionist foreign policy, a foreign policy designed to change the general order of the international system since at least uh, 2007, when he gave a famous or infamous speech at the Munich Security Conference, uh, in which he outlined that essentially the world he lived in was a world imposed by the West, and he was seeking to change it substantially. And he kind of proved his intention when he launched a massive cyber attack on Estonia in the summer of 2007. And this is in response to the Estonians taking down a statue thanking the Soviets for liber liberating them from the Nazis, because of course the Soviet Union um, swallowed Estonia in 1940, as well as the other Baltic states. And then of course he proved it further when he launched an invasion of Georgia in the summer of 2008. And he followed that with his war in Ukraine in 2014, which began with the seizure of Crimea, and then the conduct of a not quite covert hybrid war in Donbass. It's taken the West and the United States a long time to realize how hostile Putin's activity was. Uh, a recent book came out characterizing the papers that the Bush administration prepared for the Obama administration in 2008-2009. And you read the section there on Russia, and it's basically clueless about R Putin's revisionist objectives. If you look at Obama's policy towards Russia um, right after the Georgian invasion, which occurred in August of 2008, three months before Obama was elected, it was also clueless about Putin's hostile intentions toward the United States and the West. So you had the famous reset. And even after the seizure of Crimea in 2014 and the launch of Moscow's war in Donbass, the West responded tentatively. They didn't fully understand what Putin was up to. Yes, significant sanctions were imposed on Russia at that time, but I was involved in the debates back in 2014 and 2015 to arm Ukraine against Russian tanks. And um, we lost the debates initially. Um, the Javelin anti-tank weapons were only sent in the, at the end of the first year of Donald Trump's presidency. Uh, and of course, despite Moscow's war on Ukraine in 2014 and 2015, Germany was bound and determined to go ahead with the Nord Stream 2 pipeline to make itself even more dependent upon Russian gas. The only people in the West 
uh, or the only nations in the West that understood how dangerous Putin's policies were for us were Russia's neighbors, the Baltic states, Poland, Romania. And they were arguing at that time, going back to 2014 and 2015, which their supposedly sophisticated betters in Washington, in Brussels, in Berlin, in Paris, rejected as paranoia. Well, the Eastern Europeans were right. Washington, Berlin, Paris, Brussels were wrong. And after the big invasion, of February 2022, we began to see for the first time a somewhat, even here I'm qualifying, a somewhat resolute policy to stand up to Putin's aggression. Now, let me just digress for a moment to talk about the debate that's been going on for nine years since Moscow's war in Ukraine and that intensified after the big invasion uh, 15 months ago as to why this all happened. You'll find many people who don't know a great deal about Putin's Russia, who claim that this is a result of NATO's enlargement that began after the Cold War ended, and that the possibility of Ukraine joining NATO, which was discussed and affirmed in a very vague way at the NATO summit in Bucharest in 2008, was the reason for Putin's war. The only problem with this analysis is that this war began over a trade issue. Ukraine began to negotiate a trade agreement with the European Union um, when Viktor Yanukovych was president. And by the spring and summer of 2013, while Yanukovych was still president, it looked like that peace deal, excuse me, that trading deal was going to be reached. And Moscow immediately levied sanctions on Ukrainian exports to Russia to coerce them into not signing this deal. And Yanukovych was frightened and the deal seemed to be ended, which led to serious demonstrations in Kiev. And when Yanukovych cracked down, on those demonstrations, you had even bigger demonstrations, ultimately leading to Yanukovych's fleeing Ukraine. It's worth noting that when all this happened, Ukraine's constitution said it was a neutral country that would not join any blocs. So there was no danger of Ukraine joining NATO when Moscow seized Crimea and then when it launched its war in Donbass. So those who say this war is about, about Ukraine joining NATO are people who don't understand history, don't understand the dynamics. Uh, it's worth noting, too, something uh, in this debate, which I've covered, you might say, implicitly. The Some of the people who argue that the United States should not be supporting Ukraine and NATO should not be supporting Ukraine with weapons, claim that Putin's objectives only extend to making sure that Ukraine does not join NATO. They fail to talk about the draft treaties that Putin sent to the United States in December of 2021 and to NATO at the same time, which stated his objective was to establish substantial political control across the entire territory of the former Soviet Union, which includes our NATO allies, the Baltic states. And it also demanded a veto of the defense policy of all the states that used to be part of the Warsaw Pact, which includes another more than half dozen NATO allies, Poland, Romania, and so on. So Putin's objectives in his war on Ukraine are to establish that political control in Ukraine, to destroy Ukrainianness, which is something that Dmitry Medvedev, the former president of Russia, and the Russian media have said, which also sounds a lot like genocide, and that appeasing Putin by forcing Ukraine into a territorial compromise for an uncertain peace would not fix 
So what's happened since the big invasion in February of 2022? As I think you know, uh, you have to give the Biden administration credit for providing substantial support to Ukraine and for rallying NATO to provide substantial support for Ukraine and working with the EU and others in imposing sanctions on Russia and economic, providing economic support for Ukraine. And this is no small achievement and it has been adequate to the task of making sure that Putin cannot win a victory in Ukraine. But the policy has not been much more than adequate because we have not taken the decisive steps with our allies. And if we do these, if we take these decisive steps, our allies will follow to give Ukraine all the weapons that it needs to decisively defeat the Kremlin. If you follow the war, you know that while the administration brilliantly laid out what Russia would do in Ukraine, they were equally ignorant in anticipating the Ukrainian reaction. They thought that Kiev would fall within weeks. They thought that Putin would establish control in the heart of Ukraine very easily. And of course, it turned out quite differently. It may well be that the administration's very bad intelligence on Ukraine's ability to fight explain why the administration was very weak in sending weapons to Ukraine before the big invasion and for several weeks after it began. They wanted to avoid, avoid the dreadful embarrassment that they faced justly in Afghanistan when the Taliban captured billions of dollars of American military equipment. Uh, but even after it became clear that Ukraine was successfully defending Kyiv, successfully defending Kharkiv, which is even more interesting because that's Ukraine's second largest city, located less than 60 miles from the Russian border, and Ukraine successfully defended Chernihiv, a large city in the north, near, not too far from Belarus. Uh, but even then, the administration was slow in sending Ukraine the weapons it needed. They were slow sending stingers, which can knock out aircraft very efficiently at the range of up to 10,000 feet. They were slow at sending um, rockets that can destroy ships. And Russians were using ships, especially those first six months after the big invasion, to launch devastating missile attacks on Ukrainian cities. They were slow to send the HIMARS, a military system, an artillery system none of us heard of, we now all know about. Uh, in the early days after the invasion, we sent HIMARS with a range of 40 kilometers, which were insufficient because after Moscow's defeat around Kiev, around Kharkiv, they regrouped and began an offensive in eastern Ukraine in Donbass which was making steady progress starting by April of last year and extending until late June, early July. Ukraine was asking for high Mars with a, a longer range in order to stop that offensive. And the president said no multiple times. Uh, and then the administration got mad when Zelensky, in defense of Ukraine's interests, but also in defense of American interests, although the administration didn't understand that, um, was approached Congress and said, please help us get these weapons. Because most Republicans, except for the isolationist Trump faction, want to get these the better weapons to Ukraine. And a lot of Democrats do too, although they were willing to heed the strictures of the White House and not speak up publicly in favor of those weapons. Privately, yes, publicly, no. And as you all know, when the administration finally changed its mind and sent the high Mars with a range of 85 kilometers, they arrived in Ukraine at the end of June. The Ukrainians immediately ended that Russian offensive. Not only did they end that Russian offensive, but they began a counteroffensive, which took back over half of the territory Moscow seized since February of last year. But sadly, the uh, timidity, the hesitation of the administration in sending more advanced weapons to Ukraine continues to this day.
Uh, the Ukrainians have been begging for patriots and for uh, advanced tanks from the West since or for over a year. And we said no, no, no to both. Finally, in October, when Moscow began its big attack on Ukrainian infrastructure, the administration decided to send patriots. Thank goodness. I applaud the decision, but it was late. Uh, the administration and Germany were playing footsie, agreeing not to send tanks to Ukraine until they were embarrassed by the Brits working with the Poles. The Brits decided to send their tanks. The Poles and others were pushing hard to be able to send the German-produced Leopard tanks. And finally, the, the US and Germany agreed to send tanks. But even then, that timidity was apparent when the administration first told the world, oh, the tanks we send, the Abrams, would only arrive next year. Then they changed their mind and agreed they could arrive in the fall, and now we're sending them. Good, we're sending them sooner. But again, the, the pattern of hesitation continues. And why is this? I'm sorry to say it, because it, it does not speak well of our policymakers, that they have been intimidated by the Kremlin's use of nuclear threats. Now, let's be clear. Moscow is a nuclear power. So any statesman and stateswoman needs to consider the possibility that nuclear weapons will be used when a nuclear power is in a war and when that nuclear power is talking about using nuclear weapons. But the United States has had, at this point, over 70 years of experience in this field. There's a long history and a, an advanced literature on this, none of which seems to have enlightened the administration's approach. Because we stood down Putin's nuclear saber rattling in the Berlin crisis in 1961, and of course, in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And we never said publicly during those crises, we cannot do X or we cannot do Y because Russia may escalate and use nuclear weapons. We have self-deterred because of Putin's nuclear intimidation. And I recommend to everybody, as evidence of what I'm describing, an article written in Politico in the middle of uh, February, just before the Munich Security Conference. Uh, we have said, senior American officials have said 8, 10, 15 times since the big invasion, we, can, we cannot do something, whether it was establishing a free fly zone in Western Ukraine, establishing a shipping convoy to get Ukrainian grain to world markets, or sending various weapon systems. We can't do this because Russia may escalate. That is not how a superpower behaves. And we only encourage the Russians to do more of this, and we encourage the Chinese as well. That's why I called the administration's policy adequate to the task of having stopped the Russian victory in Ukraine, but not strong enough to ensure a quick victory. And by not doing that, it risks, it risks a defeat over time. Putin is, besting that the, is betting the United States and our European partners in NATO, our allies, will, does, do not have the staying power he has for war. I think he's wrong. I think the administration understands that if Putin were to win in Ukraine, um, they would go down as one of the worst foreign policy administrations in American history. But they have been, in fact, again, intimidated by Putin's threats, and that keeps them overly cautious. There are Russians who are part of the, uh, you might say, are patriotic Russians who've said publicly, there's no way Putin's going to use nukes unless, in fact, NATO were attacking Russia. So for, for us to send more advanced weapons so Ukraine could defeat the Russians in the south and make Putin's hold on Crimea very tenuous, is it's possible, but highly unlikely. Yeah, that, this is fascinating, Ambassador Ernst. One, I think that it's really, you provided a lot of really valuable background information, a lot of history that probably I would say many people in the U.S. and around the world are not really familiar with. So right. I think that's really important. And then to have a better understanding of why our um, administration is making the decisions that it is now, 
is also really important for us to, to have a good understanding of. So I really appreciate that. We have a, a question from our audience. I was wondering if Please. you'd be willing to take sure. a question. Absolutely. Okay, wonderful. So they said, Ambassador Herbs, thank you for being here. Engine focuses on promoting English language fluency. Can you speak to the importance of English communication skills in relation to, to international relations and post-war economic development for Ukraine? English is now the international language. And for anyone who wants to work internationally, being fluent in English is essential. Uh, and of course, one of the impressive things about Ukraine is the number, the large number of young fluent English speakers. Um, I, don't, I don't have the statistics at my, at my command, but certainly there are many scores of English speakers, for example, in Ukraine's Rada. Uh, reconstruction of Ukraine is going to be a major international project after Moscow loses its war of aggression. And English will be essential for most people participating in it. Obviously, there are senior Ukrainian officials who don't speak English, and that will not be a bar to their participation. Um, same is true for from officials from some other countries. But all of those officials will have aides who speak excellent English. So I applaud those who are promoting the study of English. I also applaud those in the United States who, who are advancing the study of foreign languages, which we are not good at, at. Yes, thank you. I appreciate it. Well, I, uh, thank you for your time today. It was really a pleasure to have you. And really, you brought a lot of um, great knowledge. And we're, we're thankful you're willing to share it with us. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. You're welcome. Bye now.